Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roger Addison. I've known Roger for a long time, even before coming to Boise State. Roger was a friend to us at DLS group and my boss and mentor and friend, Deborah Stone. Um, we have followed Roger's work at ISPI for a long, long time. And my first ISPI conference was in 1989. Today, Roger join, uh, joins us to review basic principles of performance improvement through the view of his performance architecture. The model synthesizes work of a number of different performance improvement theorists, and it presents broad guidelines about principles of performance technology, a systematic approach, a systems viewpoint, the work environment. During our time together, Roger will introduce and explain the model. He'll align different HPT models with different levels of performance at the worker, process, workplace, and community levels. And he'll also address your questions. Roger, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks for asking me and thanks for the introduction. I, nice and short. Um, people often ask me, uh, where did the performance architecture frame or framework come from? And it was interesting that when I was working with, I worked with a large financial institution for about 17 years. And during that time, I always brought in consultants to work with me because they made me smarter. And one of the people that I brought in was uh, an architect. Uh, and actually he was an architect that de dealt with not only build buildings, but also an architect that dealt with information. So he was great with information mapping and information work. So we, we, we got discussing one day about his methodology and performance improvement methodology. And interesting enough, they're very, very similar. Um, they basically go through some, some of the same steps. So it just came about, I was the performance guy, he was the architect guy. So we coined the word performance architecture. And it sort of caught on because I was interested in building performance, sustainable performance systems, as opposed to always fixing stuff. Uh, fixing stuff is really expensive, but building it correct the first time, it makes it, you know, you spend a lot of money, but if you do it the, do it the right the first time, you have a, a, a leg up on how, how, all the whole system aspect of it. So that's how performance architecture came about. Th then I wrote a book <laughs> uh, with a couple of colleagues, uh, Carol Haig and Lynn Kearney, called Performance Architecture. And in there, what we tried to do is lay out the uh, four levels, and I'll explain what the four levels are later on, and all the tools that went with them, because we always got asked, what tools or what models do I use at the individual level, at the process level, at the organizational level? And so we said, maybe it's time for us to figure all this stuff out. So that's what I'm going to introduce to you as well, as we go through this whole process, because always people always tell me, oh, I know all these tools and all these models, when am I supposed to use them? Uh, we tried to basically capture that in the book. So uh, the flow of the agenda that I'm going to use today is talk a little bit about the background, going from models to principles and standards, which is a big leap forward for ISPI, which is the International Society of Performance Improvement. Uh, then we're going to look at some of the systems models out there and how they're classified. So it's a little classification process. Um, I have a little bit of work around uh, what a performance consultants do. So I'll introduce you to a, a nice little model by Gary Rumler. Now, if you don't know the work of Gary Rumler, I suggest you get his books out and start reading them because that is a wealth of information. And he's a great, he's easy reader and is a great read. And he's got some really good uh, models in his books. Um, then we're going to take a look at what I call the performance improvement landscape. And what we look at is how we think, what we do, and where we work. And then all that comes together and I call RSVP plus, and I'll tell you about what RSVP stands for. And then we have questions and answers. But if you have questions along the way, you know, as we said, just put them in the chat box and we'll try to answer them as we go forward, or we'll save them to the end either way. And then finally, I'm gonna end up looking at uh, another model, which I think is kind of important right now. Uh, and it was sort of the, the work of Roger Kaufman um, in what we call architecture, 
or mega architecture. And this is working with more societal aspects of it. And he and I, he, before he died, he just died a couple of months ago, but before he died, we did an article together and it was called Mega and the World in the Pandemic Age. Because we thought everybody sort of has, has seen all come together because we have a common thing across the world. That's one of the first things that, that we've ever seen that we had a really common um, value or common enemy, as you want to make a look at it, across the world. And people are trying to solve the problem. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Does that make sense, everybody? I hope. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so if you look at uh, out there, uh, and you probably look at the textbooks, there are hundreds of models. And these are just a few. There's models by B.F. Skinner, sort of the person kind of started all of our thinking this way. There are models by Tom Gilbert. There are models by Gary Rummler. There are Dale Brethauer had models, George Geis, um, Sue Marco, Joe Harless. I mean, uh, Jim Evans, Floyd Homme. These are the people that were the founders of performance improvement, or what we called ISBI, or NSPI at that time, the National Society for Performance Improvement. So all these models were sort of sitting out there and nobody could, well, actually what happened is that each person would have their own model because they were trying to sell their products and services. So it became, my model is quote, better than your model. But if it came down to it, there were some commonalities to all the models. And so that was when we decided to say, let's see if we can look at what the commonalities are and go from there forward. So the model, so we went from a model to a more of a principles and standards thinking. And this was a major leap forward in ISBI and to see that models had some commonality. So the commonality is basically looking at going from behaviors, means, we're not focusing on the behaviors, we're focusing on the ends, accomplishments. So that's that was a big change in our thinking. Even though each of the each, each of those uh, people had their own models, they always talk about accomplishments. But behaviors got sort of mixed up in the whole uh, genre of how we kind of work. So I want to encourage you to think not necessarily about behaviors, but think about what those behaviors do. They turn into some type of ends, accomplishments, or results. So we want to identify. The, the mega impact or the world impact. We wanted to look at how we get there through these different tools and resources and how do you know that you have arrived? And that's through the metrics and measurements at the very end of the process. Although we were talking earlier, uh, this is an iterative process and so it really never ends, uh, if, especially if you have good maintenance. So from, a, from a really looking at the aspect of it, from a, not necessarily a training focus, but the integration of the four levels, what we call the four levels being world, those things that we can impact with mega at the world impact, the workplace or the organization or the enterprise, the, the work, the processes that people do and the worker. Now, if you look at each of these areas, there are models and tools that go with each one of these areas, these four areas. And that's sort of our job as performance consultants to figure out which tool or which model to use at those four levels, knowing that we're not focusing on any one model, but usually the integration, that's why I put integration on there, the integration of all these four levels. So the performance consultants you're looking at as an, in, an integration model. Okay, uh, if you look at one of the most we basically are systems thinkers. So we try to look from a system standpoint and look at the aspect of how we, what we accomplish through these systems. So we think of the end in mind, then we look at the factors that, and the variables that influence the results and how we then put all those things in a systems approach to get to some type of way of measuring or the gaps or the opportunities of improving performance. We try to improve it because they can, those things can exist any place in the system. And we have to know where they are, are those variables in the system and how they work. So the, one of the first things you have is that you have the individual performer system. And that's usually what we're all familiar with is, are the people's aspect of it. So the people drive a lot of the work we do, 
but it's just only one of the variables when we look at it. But they still have their way of only looking at one piece of it, but they still have their factors. The next one is the job performance or the processes. So that's the next area. And they also work on the same idea. They have various management, they have various job designs, they have various not, but they all kind of come together in a piece to go out there and get the results. And then finally, or not finally, but the next one is that there's that process that goes through this, that every organization has a process that they're working off of. So they also have different factors, management, process design, resources, all those contribute to a good management system through processes. And then, then at the organizational level, you have the organization, the same, they have different variables. And you have to look at those variables and see what impacts those areas. And then finally, you have a, a network of organizations. If you look at big um, uh, organizations, they have sort of taken for a bank, for example, they not only have the corporate, but they have all the branches that go with it. So those are the, the, the one we talk about, a network of organizations to improve the performance, because then you have to look at the whole thing. This becomes important, especially when you work at anything that, I do a lot of work for the government and the military, and they basically are all based upon big networks and how the networks work together. So I'm suggesting that you have to look at from the standpoint of the logic around those networks. Okay, then there was, uh, then we came up with performance improvement models or frameworks. And I like the word framework rather than models because I think it, it just it expands our thinking around it. So we went from the frameworks that dealt with individual performers to frameworks dealing with society, Omega, and the world. Now, one of the things in the early history of ISPI or NSPI was that you saw that a lot of people were very good at training people, but the problem was that, tra that training was not sustainable. So they tried to figure out what is the problem we're having here. We're doing good work, but it's not transferring over to the workplace. And so they came up with models saying, well, maybe it's not just our training that's involved, but maybe there's other factors here that we should be looking at. So you start looking at what are the different factors of trying to improve performance. It's just not a training function, it's a multiple factor here. So we looked at all of the models. I brought, I brought a lot of those people that I showed you on the first slide, or on those first slides. I brought them together in a room and I said, what do all your models have in common? And what we came up with is that this, what we call the performance technology landscape, performance improvement landscape, was the first thing we looked at and said, what does every model out there have in common? And what every model out there had in common was on the left-hand side, which well, there's some type of work environment. And either the models had something to do with the individual worker, the operations, which were processes. Some of the models had to do with workplace or the enterprise. Some of the models had to do with society. So that was one thing that they all had in common that sometimes they focused on one piece of it, or sometimes they focus across all the all the in all the areas. The other one was at the bottom. It basically is this systems thinking or the systems viewpoint is that they all basically had some type of looking at what the conditions they were looking at, what were the inputs, what were the processes that they were looking at, which was the outcomes or the results they were focusing on, what were the feedback systems. So they all have these in common in some way. Again, each model maybe emphasize one piece more than another piece, but they all these had all these in common. The other thing they all had in common was this middle part, which was the principles, the four principles. They all focused, this was the RSVP model. So they all came about and said, we all focus on results or the accomplishments. Every one of the models looked at, and is that one of the major things that they looked at? The next one, they all took a systems viewpoint, and that's the S, a systems viewpoint as, as they went forward. All of them basically had added value, and the added value was in, did they have some, how could they measure it? Can they measure what they're doing? And the last one that all of them had in common was that they had partnerships. And partnerships came in two functions or two 
aspects. One was the partnerships of, with the clients because they are part of the, what we're trying to accomplish here. And the next one is that if you look at any organization, there are a lot of people in the organization that you need as partners to get your thing implemented. So those are the partners in the organization that we saw was also important. There was another aspect of this, and this is on the right-hand side. Each of them had a systematic approach, a step-by-step -step procedure. Now, these, this is just a, a basically the foundation, but if you look at all the different people out there talking about it, they may not call them the same thing, but they have a systematic flow of what they did, everything from identifying the need uh, to the, what the results were, what they were gonna do, how they were gonna do it, what they did and how to evaluate it. Now, again, if you look at the different people or the different um, theorists, they were having, they may call it something different, but that's basically the, the, a systematic approach that they followed. That was the landscape that every one of the models we saw had in common. So that was somewhat, so that's when we decided to go from a model driven to more of the of, of a standards driven. And that's where ISPI then became standards approach. And that's when they, and you also see that they decided to have a certification process using standards rather than models. Okay, then um, several years ago, and this came out of the book also, several years ago, I was working with a friend of mine, uh, Klaus Witkin. And Klaus and I were looking at, you know, what is sort of the progression of the different uh, models out there. So the first models were from IS, uh, NSPI, were models that are ideas that came around programmed instruction. And these were, that was the founding of this year, B.F. Skinner, and he had these basic ways learning, uh, learning models, basically what they were. The next one, and these are not in a time order, these are more uh, classification order. So I don't think the next model was Tom Gilbert's model. Tom Gilbert's model, sometimes called the six boxes, dealt more with the classification of individual performers. So the idea of individual performers has certain variables that make a difference in how they get work done. And that was somewhat of a breakthrough. Tom Gilbert came up with that. So as Bob Mager came up with it, uh, there were several other theorists that came up with this. That's it's, it's individual performers. There are various variables that had to be looked at. The next thing that the next classification was um, was done by Dale Brethauer and Gary Romler. And they took the individual performers, but put them into a systems thinking approach. So that was the next big breakthrough was the idea of the individual performer was in a system and all the variables, as I showed you earlier, had to be looked at as we went through this. So the systems approach became a way of rest of thinking. Gary Rummer expanded that into the models that dealt with the organizational or performer level. And those were now dealing with the variables at the much larger organizational level. Then comes along Klaus Wittgen, and that's when Klaus and I started working, then there are networks of organizations that have to be put together to understand that. And these are the social systems that are, you had to look at from the standpoint of improving performance. And then finally, we look at the work of Roger Kaufman uh, looking at from the societal level, that was the next. So these are the basically frameworks that you can identify when you start doing your analysis and start going back and saying, what, what models do I need to look at? They sort of follow into learning models, individual performer models, individual performer models dealing with more of systems thinking into network models and into society models. Every time you do any of your work, it's gonna fall under one of those, I think it's gonna follow one of those characteristics. At least that's from my, from my experience. So in complex, in complex systems, and I deal with the work I do, deal with fairly complex systems, you have to look at, you encounter all those levels and all those levels have to be aligned in some way. If you don't align them, you're not going to be able to solve the major problems of organizations. So that's just a review of when we start looking at it from the standpoint, you gotta think not only of individual learners, but you've gotta think of the individual learners in some type of performance system. Those performance systems exist in a organization, the organization, 
ends into a network. And if you want to have impact in society, that's what you should be looking at all the way through. So it becomes just a, not a focus on one part of it, it's a focus on everything. So the landscape becomes important to us, as well as an architectural aspect. Each of those things have to be designed well in order for us to improve performance at the, organ at the cultural level. Now, um, as I mentioned, Gary Rumler, his work was kind of interesting is that he took the same aspect of, of um, Tom Gilbert and Tom Gilbert and Gary were partners. And a lot of these times you, you understand why they, all these models look alike because at one time all these people worked with each other in some way. So this was Gary Rumler's answer to Tom Gilbert model around six boxes. And this is how Gary Rumler talked about performance improvement system has the same aspect of it. But one thing that Gary added, which I think was very important, is this, this area of consequences. The outputs have consequences to the organization. And those consequences can either be positive or negative to the ind individual or to the organization. So always think about when you're doing your work, you ask the question, I wonder what the consequences of what we're implementing here, what we're trying to do has on the organization or the individual. So the consequences being positive or negative. The other thing is important to understand the feedback systems, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, how important that is. So this is just a review that uh, if you look at a, it's like a, um, if you think about those uh, stacking dolls that the Russian have, Petruska, doll, Petruska dolls, it's sort of a stacking areas. We start with the human performance system, the performance goes into processes, processes go into the whole process of the system, which now goes into the models of using of what a whole organization looks like and the, those go, feed into that organization. Those things feed into the aspect of it. They just keep nesting on each other. Those systems go into multiple systems. And then finally, we have going into society. That's the stacking of the Petruska dolls. <laughs> so you have to think of how all these things kind of work together but also, it's, it's kind of, if you just think and sit back and think about it, it's kind of simple. Uh, and so don't make it really complex on yourself. Sit back and say, you know, is it individual performer I'm looking at it? Are there processes I'm looking at? Is it something in the organization that's getting in the way of us not performing well? Or something in the organizations that are not making it all work together? Or is maybe it's even something in society. And society in particular, if you think today, with the pandemic going on, there's a lot of things happening in the society that's affecting all those other systems as we go forward. So that's, that's why I think it's important to look at everything. As performance consultants, you know, as um, you, you really get, um, and I think Gary has a, a, has a nice little interesting model here, is that um, Gary's, you know, you have somebody in the organization comes to us and they ask us to do something. And usually they ask us to build them a training program or build them a, a something that they have in mind. And what we're saying is that you, if you just basically go and reproduce what they had in mind, you become an order taker. And so what we're suggesting here is you don't become an order taker, you have a different path. And what you need to probably go do is go inside and look and see what's going on. So the questioner comes to somebody or somebody in the organization asks you to do something, come up with some type of solution. And your response is, yes, and do you mind if I take a look within the organization to see what's going on? Because usually what they want, they don't know what they want, <laughs> frankly. They think they do, but often they don't know what they want. They use training as their go-to uh, solution because that seems to be um, something, there's something wrong with the people out there. And if you can just fix those people, everything will be fine. And as you know, this is a system and it's not necessarily the people and rarely, and I'll show you in a few minutes, why it's very seldom the people. So you basically go in and you look, uh, you find out what the gap and what you're trying to find out what the gaps are. And usually those gaps are gaps in results. And you want to find out what results is that manager trying to achieve that maybe you can help with. What are the critical business issues that he's actually dealing with as we go forward? 
So what, what, is, what are you trying to do here? What solutions? Basically what you're trying to be solution neutral as you go through your analysis. And you want to follow what they call path E, which you go back in and examine what's going on here. You want to take a look for yourself, make sure you do the observation. Never ask, if you ask people, they're gonna tell you what they think it is as opposed to what it really is. So become good observers of what's going on. And you take basically a problem solution aspect. And this is being going from the standpoint of being solution neutral as we basically go inside the organization and find out what's happening. So the assumptions that we have here is that performance consulting follows path E, which we means is that you go inside the organization, look and see what's really happening, what is the, what's really going on. And it's just not necessarily a training issue, it's a something else issue. And then follow path E where you start going through the performance improvement. So you're acting as a performance consultant, which we call it, what they're called various things. Um, their goal is to basically close the gap or, or build a new performance system. Um, they remain solution neutral during their analysis, which is extremely important. Once you have a solution in mind, it's going to affect your analysis. So you try to remain as much as you can as being solution neutral as we go forward. Um, it's usually not a role of a full-time job, although when I worked inside the financial organization, I did have performance consultants working with me, or I hired them to work with me. So it wasn't necessarily, not necessarily a full-time role, but often it was, it, it depends on how you structure the organization. Um, they, they apply some type of methodology to improve performance. They follow the basic performance improvement of RSVP. That's focus on results, take a systems view, add value to your measurement and find out who your partners are. And then what I was just interested in is not only um, you know, fixing problems all the time, but if you can build a good sustainable performance system and integrating the, the work, worker and workplace and the impact on the world, then you, I think you, then you become a, what I call a serious perform or what Gary Rummer called a serious performance consultant. These are the people that out there that have, that can make impact into the design. And that's why you start seeing, and Gary's latest books, he calls them performance architects also. So I think if you take from an architectural building performance system, you have more impact than you do of just fixing systems. So think, think bigger about here, but also go back and just spend some time on those models I showed you and see where you can fit in some of the things that you already know are the individual performer models are they, or tools, are they process tools, are they organizational tools, or are they uh, mega tools. If you can kind of classify those to yourself, then you're on the road of becoming a performance consultant. At least that's my opinion. So our basic assumptions, RSVP, we focus on results of what I said, establish partnerships, um, you, you diagnose before you prescribe. You basically observe, so you look before you speak. Uh, focus groups are okay, but they, they're, not, they're not that great. And questionnaires are, are a waste of time. Uh, for at least they don't, you, know, you don't get to the information that you really need asking, sending out questionnaires. Go look for yourself. So become really good at uh, observation. And the... Um, um, then also then the aspect of becoming more of a performance consultant. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you a story about observation real quickly, uh, just to prove my point. Um, there was one organization we were working with that um, they were looking at their productivity had gone, had gone down. And the productivity had gone down because they actually moved to a new building. And so after they moved to a new building, they started looking at the, the uh, productivity charts and they noticed that in, in the afternoons, the productivity went down. They said, well, it must be just because they don't know how to do it. So would you come in here and retrain these people to, uh, to, to, to do? Now, would, would retraining make any difference, do you think, of people who already knew how to do their job? So there was probably something else going on in the organization, especially they said, what only happens in the afternoon? Well, there's a clue right there. So it tells you, why don't you go out and look what's happening in the afternoon 
to this to this job. So one of the things I told you, they moved into a brand new building, and this was a data processing center. And one of the things that happened in the afternoon is that you had um, glare come in because the sun was on the windows, and then they would have glare on their computer screens. So it wasn't a basically a performance issue around more training. It was why don't we put curtains on the windows? <laughs> or something else that gets in the way. We, we gave our solution and then it wasn't exactly put curtains on the windows, but there's other things you can do. But that had nothing to do with training. So you had to be really careful when somebody asked you for a solution or they had the solution. Just ask, do you mind if I go look? And that's your observation. So that's my really fast story on why observation is important. Fo uh, focus on results. Um, the the, mod the uh, drawings you're going to see here are by Lynn Kearney, and Lynn was one of my co-authors uh, on the book. And so we call it um, the, the art and science of improving performance. And what, the art was the, the models themselves were, we, we thought we'd be, if you can make them clear, would have an impact with, the, our, with, in, or with our clients. So this was our one was the first one we came up with was, so focus on results was that you want to have people look what the results were, and usually you're trying to improve the time or the people or the productivity or having some type of savings. Um, that's basically what we looked at that over and over again. Those were the, some of the same variables that we saw come up time and time again. People wanted to save time, they wanted to save money, they wanted to have, they wanted to fix their people, which we, as I mentioned, that's not always the case. They wanted to increase productivity or they want to increase service in some way. Those were the most often things that came up by the request. So what are results? As I mentioned earlier, results are accomplishments that the receiver has value that goes into some type of result. Then the receivers are the people that are requesting the information from you. So you have some type of people out, the people out there want to have value what you're trying to do. So just think about the receivers are those people, and they can be stockholders, shareholders, uh, their clients can all be the receivers of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a process you're working on, so accomplishment. So think accomplishments and not behaviors, please. So what is performance? As I mentioned, performance has two parts, activities plus results. That's the definition of, of a, what a what a what a basically performance is, and performance behaviors. Remember, behaviors add cost to any organization. Where accomplishments add value, so the more the more behaviors you do in the organization, the more costs go up. So what you want to do is always focus on the ends, the the accomplishments, as opposed to means behaviors. And that's just a, one of the little rules that I learned a long time ago. And that's, that's from the work of actually Tom Gilbert, put that in his, some of his work. I mentioned to you uh, systems thinking, and this is a, a classic model that uh, Lynn developed for us. And this is kind of thinking of what, uh, what systems are all about. So if you kind of keep this in your head, is that there are people who receive your results. That's the receiving system I've already mentioned. There's some type of output that increase the results, and sometimes these are our business uh, outcomes. There are processes that people, activities do. Now, if you look at it, if you look at the process box, that's where all of your costs are in that process box. So if you look at process, if you can streamline those processes that reproduce streamlined outputs that get you the results, receivers are gonna get what they require. There are inputs, and the inputs are listed on the Left-hand side here are their government inputs, their trends, their market inputs, their facility inputs. These are just some examples. And then um, there are two feedback systems that we look at. One feedback system is called value feedback. And the value feedback comes from the receivers or the people who are requested the information in the first place. And these can be their stockholders, they can be the shareholders, or they can be anybody who has a stake in the organization. So these are people who give, give feedback, is, is it working? The other one we have 
performance feedback, and this is internally in the system, making sure we always monitor what is going on within the system to allow us to go back and correct. So sometimes it's called corrective feedback as well. So performance feedback, value feedback are the two areas that we always look at when we're trying to look at it. Now, one thing we added to this model later on was culture. Um, because what we looked at from the standpoint, if you didn't understand the culture of the organization, then you were always going to have problems. And one of the things that we also said is that um, you know, basically culture somewhat drives our thinking uh, in this. So you know, there's various ways that people say, you know, culture is, is, is important consideration. So understanding, the, and the, understanding that aspect of it became really important to us. Now where that came about, is that uh, when I worked for the financial organization, um, we had uh, in seven, I was there 17 years and I went through 17 mergers and acquisitions. And culture makes a major difference understanding if that, if that merger acquisition is gonna be smooth or bumpy. And if you understand the cultures that are coming into your organization, you can make it a lot easier on yourself. So we started doing what we call cultural due diligence in order for us to figure out what was going on. This is also true if anybody's been through a reorganization trying to bring two organizations together. If you do not do a cultural audit or a cultural due diligence, you're not going to have a smooth, um, basically reorganization. So that's where culture also becomes in play here. So uh, when culture meets strategy, uh, culture always wins. That's, just, that's what we found out. So. Think, think culture as you go, go forward. I, th I threw this in because I, I like Gary Rummer saying here, and you'll see this over and over again. If you put good people in a bad system, the system will win every time. And I think if you think of your, your, your work that you've done, and you think that you maybe have done always a good job, but you just can't figure out what is going on here. There's something in this organization that screwed up or something's not working, it's the system, not the people. And I'll prove that to you, or well, not prove it, but I'll show you that thinking as we go forward. So you take a systems view, uh, you combine your, your, your consulting skills with your communication skills. You recognize that these, you have to look at the symptoms and not the causes uh, and the causes, but the but you're always, you always try to say focus on symptoms. Don't focus, try, try not to look at the symptoms. Look at maybe what the causes are. And then the relationship between what's going on internally and what's going on externally. So internally and externally. So you look at it right now. A good example is the pandemic is a major force on the outside of the organization that's, that's affecting these performance systems. Look at the dire straits our educational system is in. That tells you something outside the organization that we have no control or very little control over is affecting the way the organization works. And if we can get our hands around that, then we can basically improve the performance of the organization. So we want to add value. The way we add value is by the metrics we have. And if you can basically show those societal metrics, I think you're even better. Look at, and basically you can measure anything uh, as you probably all know. Uh, if you can name it, you can, and measure it. Um, look at the metrics that are that are important to your client, and I'll show you a model later on, or show you some ways to look at that later on. Uh, what what we want to do is measure that has value to the receivers, so that's important. And then we want to take uh, and you know look at understanding the likelihood of adopting those behaviors, or or the new approaches that we're trying to do. So we're trying to look at. And I mentioned this I was in the, before you all came on board, is looking at how are you going to sustain this as you go forward? So these are becomes your sustainability of adding the value. And if you can stay, sustain it, then you really got a good performance system, a good maintenance system involved. Establish partnerships. Uh, as I mentioned, you have your clients or your, or your stakeholders or your partners. So a good stakeholder analysis is important. And then you have other people, other people in the organization who also engage in improving performance. And it's sort of like the, the, um, the old Sophie tale about the elephant and the blind man. Each of them go and talk a piece of the elephant 
and they all have their own way of describing what the elephant looks like. So what our job as good performance consultants is bringing all these groups together and saying, how can we solve the problem that we're what we initiated going? How this worked out, <laughs> I wish I had stories there a lot. How this, how this happened is that I used to run a juvenile uh, school for um, young men and women who either they went to the, my school or they went to prison. And these kids were not that bad. So we started looking at it. How, so, and they're usually their education was really, they, could, they had a hard time reading, their mathematics scores were really low. And so we first started thinking that if we would just improve their um, uh, math scores and their reading scores, this would really be helpful in their education. But we soon found out it's just that's only one piece of that puzzle. So then we started bringing in the social workers, we started bringing in the parents, we started bringing in all the different aspects of what impacted that student's life and started affecting the whole total performance system of the individual. So we started thinking it's more than just looking at one piece of it. We now had to look at the whole environment of looking at how to improve that student's, uh, student's life, basically. So um, what do we do, our practices? We have um, performance improvement processes that are systematic in nature. Uh, they look at systems, they look at subsystems or subprocesses, uh, and they practice to improve the uh, competencies or the business sustainable as we go forward. We apply these approaches in a systematic framework. The elements here, again, going back to assessment, assessing whether you have to assess first whether or not this is worthy because some problems we're given are not worthy solving. It's not worth solving. So you have to do some type of an assessment to say, is this worthy to do? Number two, always, always do a stakeholder analysis. Who are the people involved in what we're trying to accomplish here? So if you don't have a stakeholder analysis, I'm suggesting you're not going to have a worthwhile implementation. Then determine the needs or the requirements. And I prefer the word requirement the need, um, and also then looking at the opportunities as we go forward, as we, our investigation unfolds, look at the determination with the causes or the requirements and design to those requirements. What are the conditions that we're looking at? And then design the solution based upon some type of, can we implement it and maintain it? Ensure their solutions conform to some, some type of overseeing or overseering of the solution. What's the impact? in the organization or the strategy, how does it fit in together? And then can we evaluate it? That's the, the, frame, the framework I'm seeing here as we go forward. The next one was, this is just, a, just somebody asked me always, so where do we work? Um, this is a study that was done several years ago. And the places where we work is there were 30, about 30% 30 of us were consultants. That means we worked on different areas. There were about 10% 10, 10 of the people in performance improvement were academic in nature. Uh, there was a few people that were in government focus. There were about 3% in uh, armed forces and about 2% in nonprofit. So that's kind of what gives you a foundation of people in, from the standpoint of they work in industry, but finance, healthcare, insurance, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, they were, they were all across the, the organization. And where they were in 46 different countries, if you go to in the bottom I talked about, if you go to an EMEA conference, EMEA is the Performance System Network. They put on a conference every year, um, someplace in the world, and they talk about where they're, where, where they're using the performance improvement um, approaches. So if you want to go to an interesting website, go to the EMEA website. And EMEA is um, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And these are the countries that they focus on around, around the country. Now, if you really want to go to an interesting conference, uh, they, they did one last year online, and they're going to do it again this year online. And it gives you a really good um, aspect of what people are doing around the world using performance improvement. And I think it's a big, it would be a big eye-opener for some of you to, to join that conference. And, and it's usually fairly, it's very inexpensive, actually, uh, when you look at it from a conference standpoint. And if you play it right, you can also get little scholarships as you go forward. 
I, 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 I start, I always sponsor two students every year to go to the EMEA conference. And I know Margot Murray sponsors too. So if you put your ducks right, maybe you get sponsored by going to the EMEA conference. I'll say that that's sort of a challenge to all of you who want to do something. Okay, the four levels I've already mentioned, the four levels are world, workplace, work, and worker. Uh, we start with the world in mind. If you think from a broad standpoint and work your way down, then therefore you now think about how can you have impact with the fourth level. Uh, this model has also been integrated into other, other people taking the same framework and the US Coast Guard, this is how they present their model of the different levels. You can see they, they use a little bit different words, but it's still the same concepts uh, from the US Coast Guard. And what I also encourage you to do, if you see a model or a framework that you can adapt to and make a difference in, especially if you wanna work in your organizations that you think would be more words that can be used that more suit that organization, change the model. Don't, don't change the frame, don't or change the words, don't change the model, but change the word. So your clients will see, oh, the, I understand what's going on here. So that's, that's one of the things I'm gonna suggest you do. Uh, and this is an example of what the US Coast Guard did. So how can you improve performance? It's, it's quite simple. You can do two things. You can lower the cost of the activity. Because remember I said activities or behaviors add cost to the organization or you can increase the value of the performers, performance. So you raise the value or decrease the cost. These are the two classic ways of improving performance in any organization. Uh, this comes from the work of Tom Gilbert, and I think that you can see, but I really, if you really wanna do really great work, do both, lower the cost or increase the value, what we're trying to accomplish here. This is a model that's been around for a long time and originally it was a perform and I mentioned it earlier in the different models. This was a performance improvement model by Tom Gilbert working on the individual performance drivers. And he came up with six areas that basically he said had dr drove individual and basically remember he was working with individual performers. So he was saying that, and he called the first area is that we can look at the goals or information, the goals the guidelines, the feedback systems, and seeing those were in place, then we can Im improve performance. And he said, if you can look at the resources, making people have the right resources and the work design, will that improve performance? Incentives was the next area he looked at. Could you improve the compensation or the reward systems? Uh, the bottom area is skills and knowledge, the know-how and the experience, and the Next one was the mental and physical and emotional aspects. And the last one was the motives, the willingness to do the job. Those he said were the six variables that he thought was driving performance. And these were, remember, this model is an individual performer model. It's not a, now some people have taken it and, and expanded different boxes, but Tom Gilbert never, never thought of it that way. If you look at the work uh, later on, some people have taken it and rewritten it to have a different, a different value, but Tom Gilbert never talked about uh, more than individual performance. But one thing you do look at this, which I think it's kind of interesting, is if you look at each of the areas that about, to improve performance, about 35% of the time, there's something going on in that first box, setting clear expectations. Uh, there was something about 29% of the time, there was go something going on that was uh, looking at the aspect of people didn't have the tools or resources. About 11% about the time that people didn't have the proper incentives or value or, or, or being paid correctly. Only about 11% that people did not have the skills and knowledge. The 8% of the times was looking at were the right fit for the job and 6% of the time was the motives. Now, if you look at the, and so if you look at it, basically it's telling us is that the inter external factors have a bigger impact than the internal factors. And if you only focus on the training and development area, you're gonna be only about 11% of the time effective improving performance. If this is true, and we've seen a lot of people 
uh, it's now got some data to say it basically follows the same framework. If this is true, then we're going to be wrong a lot of times if we only focus on one of these areas. So we only focus 11% of the time. There's also another really an interesting um, factor here, and it's called the attribution failure number one. If you want to go, go Google that and you'll see what that is about. But attribution failure number one is that as people go out and they see something wrong in the system, the first thing they think is that there's something wrong with the people. That's why they always ask to go out and fix the people. So go look up the research and go look up the work that's been done around attribution failure number one to find out why it's not the people, it's the something else. And even if you look at Tom Gilbert's work, you're gonna say 35% of the time it's gonna be in the, um, th that work of um, setting clear expectations. This has also been reinforced by the Gallup study, which have over 100,000 people in their study. And they have said that about the same thing. The number one reason why people don't perform, it's not because they don't know how, it's because they're not set clear expectations by their management. The number two reason why is that they don't have the proper tools and resources. So, I mean, those things come up time and time again, is that rarely do we have people don't know how. Now, let me just go back. If people have gone through training, in particular, if you're ever asking clients that we need to retrain people, it has a red flag to say, well, what, now, either you didn't do very good on training the first time, then shame on you. But if it's something that they know how to do and they're not doing it now, it's not a training issue, it's a something else issue. So if you ever get a request to do a retraining, say, hmm, I wonder what's going on here that there's something else. And that's where we go to attribution failure number one. So that's the, the, one of the most important things I can tell you that's going on here. Roger, if I could interrupt for a moment, we're nearing the top of the hour. Yeah. Uh, if there's anything important, you wanna make sure that you get out before some people have to leave. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go on if it's okay with everybody. I don't have much more to go, but uh, if you have to drop off, I understand that, but uh, I'll be around afterwards too, so we can talk a little bit about this as we go forward. But that, that gives you an idea of, don't get caught up in this, that the solutions are always people issues. Um, performance consulting, I, and again, this is what you've all been waiting for. I love this model. This is the Boise State model on the spiral model, which I love about this model here. I'm hoping you've all been exposed to it some way or another, is that they always start with the valued outcome. They look at what are the, the, the things in the environment that's getting in the way, potentially, and then they have some type of organizational process. I'm only gonna go through this real quickly because I'm sure it's part of your curriculum. What's nice about this, it shows that it is a, um, it's not a step-by-step -step approach. It more or less is a, what they say is a spiral approach, which I love the idea. And I challenged them over and over again. I'll do it again out loud. If this could be animated, you just show this is an iterative process as opposed to a linear process, which is great. And then evaluation goes into here, maintenance goes into here, and they've covered everything. Uh, I just think this is one of the more important uh, flows that we have in our framework. So I'm hoping that you all adopt it and use it as you go forward. Now, there's other models out there are good, but I think this one is quite exceptional. So that's my plug for Boise. <laughs> Um, so then we know how do we be successful. The way we know it's been successful, you got to measure it. And um, I don't know if anybody, probably some of you have gone through the Kirkpatrick's uh, four levels. Um, I think, you know, here's my bias. It's a waste of time. Uh, if you do, if you, if you only do one thing, do the fourth level, all the other levels, management doesn't care uh, and what those are. But what they want is that you measure the business, the valued business results in some way. You link it to the four levels, and then you want to standpoint, can we link it to what we call a balanced scorecard? And in the book we looked at, here are all the variables or all the metrics that people use in the organization. And if you can touch one of these and increase or, or decrease one of these measures in the organization, now you're on the way of proving your value to the organization. 
So this is a balanced scorecard approach of workplace, work, and worker. And then along the other side of it, these are processes, um, conditions. So it's more of a systems thinking about how can we affect the performance of the organization using metrics that the organization already uses. Um, the, met the organization, most of the people I worked with didn't care how many people you trained a year. <laughs> they didn't care, and, they, uh, and they, they barely care if they learn something in your class. Uh, and then uh, the, the only thing they ever cared about is can you show value? Did you change something in the organization? And that's maybe at the fourth level. And, and Patrick doesn't even do a good job of that, frankly. And, and uh, Jack Phillips is okay, but again, he's still in the same way. He doesn't look at these, he doesn't look at these metrics that I think should be looked at. And that's my bias on that. So what questions do you have? Anything pop up? Are we just asking now instead of typing in the chat? If anybody wants, you can ask questions now or you can type it in the chat either way. Okay. Um, so my question, you, you talked about um, measurements at the end, you know, increasing value. And so how do you go about talking to an organization about the importance of measuring where they are now so that they can see the value, see the difference okay. later. Okay, that's what, remember in that consulting model I showed you, is that one of the things you ask is that when you came to me, what, 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 what did you see? Did, did sales go down? Did customer service go down? What, 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 what were you looking at that's, that brought you to me? So go ask your clients, how are they measuring some of the issues that they're bringing to you? So if you just ask them, they usually say, well, you know, when I found out, you know, we, we had really good customer service scores and now they went down. And so that's why I think the people need some training or retraining on cut good customer service because that will bring the scores back up. Well, that may or may not be it. You don't know. So go ask how they're measuring, how they're, how they're measured in the organization. One of the things that came up in uh, my needs analysis project was that the organization knew they had a problem with um, turnover. They didn't really know what, they didn't have a measurement of the problem. Well, and, wait, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. So what was their turnover, was their turnover rate? Um, their turnover rate turned out to be like, 12 point something and well i'd also ask you was 12 point something good or bad well apparently it was higher than it had been okay so was that also what industry was it uh financial okay was that was it teller was it tellers for example it was a so this was another hitch we had in our um in our needs analysis was that the highest turnover rate was actually in their call center, but because right. of COVID, we didn't have access to the call center employees to right. do any data collection to find out anything. So, so, that, okay, so that's where you got to find, find out is that, you know, for example, if, if it was a teller and turnover rate in a teller industry, it's mm -hmm. over 100%. So, I mean, you got to say, is 12% is bad? You don't know what what's right. so what what's the what's the turnover rate in other call centers? Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of ask that question as you go forward. So if they want to reduce it, it may be out of your hands, frankly, because the people that they hire are high turnover rate in call centers. Right. It's just the nature of the beast. It's the nature of the business, right? So you've got to ask that question as you go forward. Okay. Is that a bad number or a good number? You don't know. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else out there, guys? Roger, I have a question from Robert. He wants to know that the book you referenced, is it the 2009 version or uh, another version that's more recent? What Which one is that, the performance architecture? I believe so, yes. Yeah, no, it's, that's the only version that's out there. All right, thank you. And there's another question here from Bashir. He says, is return of investment always an issue with your clients? And if so, when would you bring it up? Yeah, actually it's not. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that you have to sort of go out there and show that there was a return on investment. So they usually don't ask for it. But just because they don't ask for it doesn't mean you don't give the end number to them. So I, would, I always said, 
is that just because they're not asking doesn't mean uh, that's not my job to show. Let me, let me show you how much this thing cost and then what the return on the investment was. So I, I always did that sort of an informal way or, or sometimes sometimes you did more formal, but rarely was I ever asked to do a return on investment. I, I think it's probably more prominent today than it was because you've got people out there asking or you have consultants out there working on it. Um, I had a question myself. Uh, so near the earlier beginning of your presentation, you said that you often get asked which model or which framework um, would you recommend for which level? And you went to, to explain the performance architecture, but you didn't answer how you would actually choose which framework. Well, that you okay, that, that's where you got. Okay, so once you go in there and decide, is this an individual performer issue? If you say yes, an individual performer issue, then you go look at the models or the tools that deal with individual performers. And so if you actually, if you go to the book, the book is laid out that way. So it's really, yeah, if you go to that book, it's laid out each chapter, basically gives you tools for uh, the work, worker, workplace. Great, okay, thank okay. you very much. Yeah. Roger, Jesse asked, did you, do you ever use the performance architecture graphic while you're working on projects? And if so, how? Sorry, it was much earlier in the um, in the presentation. So just if it was it was way back at the beginning. So if um, it was like the cube. No, 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 that cube. No, I don't show that cube. That's basically that's basically for us. I very, okay, cool. I rarely show. Actually, <laughs> most of the work I do is that if I'm going to show any models or the pictures, I'll show Lynn Kearney's pictures. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Because Thank you. the other ones just get too complicated and I just I don't mm -hmm. have to bother with them. I just and imagine that information overload would probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, so, uh, like someone would take it not what it needed to be I know or translate people, it wrong. Yeah, some people use Tom Gilbert's and they show Tom Gilbert's model as okay. they go through it. But again, it's just a matter of what seems to be, what seems to work the easiest. But I used to have, actually, when I, when I worked in the bank, um, I had Lynn Kearney used to come in and I would present in front of me and she'd be standing behind me doing all the graphics. So it would be a way of showing our work and how we did it. So if you have, if you have that luxury, that's really great. That's really neat, thank you. It really is. Yeah. We were, I love working with her, so it's always fun. So just real quickly, I'm gonna sum up then. Uh, this is the mega thinking. Uh, I mentioned that Roger Kaufman and I did an article. This came about, look at, the issues we're having around healthcare, look at the issues we're having race, race relationship, client issues, you know, go to Texas and see the problems that they're having. If that's not a big systems issue, I basically will bet you somebody from performance consulting should go in there and help them because they have a mess on their hands. Um, Sorry, and for us Canadians, that's the their reaction to the weather? Well, it's climate change. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not going to go. I used to live in Texas. Texas are great about um, being self-sufficient, and this shows having being self-sufficient kind of backfired on them. Um, if you look at Roger Kaufman's work, Roger Kaufman had what he called the ideal um, vision, and this talks about basically can we solve the world's problems? And if you have a chance, go look at read this over. I can't go over it now because I want to move on. But basically he's saying is that can we have any impact on substance abuse, disease, climate change? If we can, then we can have impact on the organization. If you look at from the standpoint of the United Nations, they have their whole, their 17 issues on sustainable development goals. And these are uh, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, gender, gender equality. Uh, these, are the 17, these are the 17 issues that the world is working on right now. Can we have any impact on those? If we can, now you're at the mega level or the world level. So if you can, you're, that's what we want to look at. I do again. I do a lot of work with the, the State Department, and the State Department tries to say, what can we do to improve hunger? What can we do to improve the education quality? What can we improve corruption in organizations, or, or not organizations, but countries? So they have basically more lofty uh, goals. Um, 
this is an inside out Mrs. Roger Kaufman's inside out approach. We should be looking at um, ends as opposed to means. So go to, always to the ends first. Just, just revalue, just looking at the four levels. In summary, we want to be able to look at, can we have any focus on the mega, the world? And, um, and, and just, just, me, just my thinking right now, especially going, especially going and having a pandemic, um, you know, we've been sitting in our house for um, over a year, almost a year now. And it gets, me, it gets me to thinking about stuff and how can I impact from a standpoint of performance improvement at that level. It's not easy, but uh, I suggest there are organizations that value that. Uh, and again, USAID, the State Department, that's where they work. If you want a lot more information, there's a website you can go to called HPT Treasures. Um, that is got hundreds of articles, models, papers, videos, there's hundreds on there that will tell you about what performance improvement is all about. So it's one of the best resources out there on performance improvement. So I encourage you to go to that website. Here's some references that you can look at. I'll give you some more references here. You want anything? So I mean, these are just things that I use and I wanna thank you for sticking with me as we go forward. I went over time, I know, but I get so excited that I can't help myself. <laughs> so thanks for sticking with me. Hi, Roger. Uh, I do have one question I wanna ask, and that is, you talked about the value of observation, and I agree. Uh, we're also now in the middle of COVID, and uh, OPAL is an all online program. And so how can people who are conducting needs assessment remotely uh, employ observation in their approach? No, I, I thought about that is, that, is that most places have, um, you can take your, you can, you can do um, cameras, online cameras, and you can have somebody walk around and you sort of be an observer of what, you, what you're seeing. And you can ask questions that, you can ask questions that way. It's not the ideal, but at least you could, you know, we have some technology out there that take your iPhone and do a, just walk around and have it in front of you. So, I mean, you could do that. And uh, Roger, you'll be sending me a copy of your slides after we're done so we can post them with your webinar? I'll do that, yes. Uh, and uh, one last comment from Bashir. Uh, Roger, your, your book is my go-to book. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, tell, I'll tell you something. We enjoyed writing it, but it's got, it's got tons of models in there that are, are tons of tools. Basically, models are, are tools also. So it's got tons of things that really help you to uh, solve basically performance issue problems. And again, as I mentioned to you, um, my, one of my partners, um, which he, you know, he wasn't working on this, but he worked with Gary Romer also on some of his models, was, um, uh, was the architect on this. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, it's like those, those things really, it really helped me get it clear because was, it was always confusing to me. Well, what model do I use? Well, some models are not appropriate or some tools are not appropriate. It's, and again, I go back to how this came about is that I remember my, my dad had a, was a master mechanic and he had a big toolbox. And I, you know, he'd tell me what this, this tool was for. And again, every tool was used for something specific. You know, so you didn't use you know, a torque wrench to, as a hammer. <laughs> you know, so every, everything had a specific reason why you used yeah. it. So why wouldn't that be mm -hmm. the same thing for us? Why wouldn't, there's lots of tools out there, but they're specifically designed for something. So use the right tool for the right, for the right issue or the right problem. Roger, I just wanted to tell you that I'm in uh, 560 right now, performance improvement, and we're, we're using your book. And the copy that I happen to acquire on Amazon is actually a signed copy. Yet. So I have, I have all of the author's autographs. Oh. <laughs> That's unusual. That's great. Well, good. <laughs> That's what's, that's what's good about buying used copies. 
I kind of have an unrelated question and I've just been curious since you started speaking. What is the show in the background on your Zoom? It's the, the Globe Theater okay. in London. Okay, I was like, what theater is that? I swear I've been in there before. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like it, so it always gives me an audience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's perfect. I like that attitude. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, joining me. Um, and uh, I appreciate your time. And I'll send, I'll send, and I, is it okay if I just send you a PDF of the slides? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. I can do that. It was just fun. Thanks for the questions, you guys. And, and again, you have my email address it's on the slide. If you have a question, uh, you know, please email me. I respond to emails. Uh, so do that. Yes. Roger, thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, we're really lucky to have had you. Uh, this is the end of our webinar and thank all of you for participating and uh, stay safe out there. Yeah, stay safe, have fun. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye.